We'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. Sebastian Geiger from Harry Watt University, who will tell us about an open access carbonate model. Thank you very much, um, Andrew, and a warm welcome for me wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I should point out it's an incredibly sunny day here in Edinburgh. Um, under different circumstance, we would have held the summit here in Edinburgh this year. We had the right weather ordered, but a little thing called COVID-19 came in. Um, and, um, yeah, um, the party couldn't start as we planned. So. What I want to talk about is research that one of our PhD students in the group, George Costa Gomez, has conducted for the last two and a half years now in partnership with Dan Arnold, who's an associate professor at Harvard Watt University. And this is about carbonate reservoir model that we are building, that we are nearly finished building. It's all going to be open access for characterizing, um, for reservoir characterization, uncertainty quantification, and history matching. And one strategic aim we have done in the group in our chair for carbonate reservoir simulation at Herdwatt University is to focus on delivering all our research as open access or open source. We have reproducible science and we can accelerate knowledge transfer more effectively. So if you have listened, as we probably, as I'm sure you have, um, carefully to Eric's talk and Arne's talk, they mentioned two models. Um, Eric talked about the Unison model, which um, Dennis Koza and his team have built. It's a carbonate reservoir model for pre-salt modeling. And Arne showed very quickly the SPE, the famous SPE 10 model um, that my Christian Martin Blunt have built nearly 20 years ago. The variety of reservoir models that the community is using to test new algorithm, to run simulations, test their concepts, to work on things like upscaling, most of them um, are focusing on clustic reservoirs, such as the punk model, SPE10, the Stanford 6 model. There's one model um, that's targeted for pre salt carbonate reservoirs, the Unison 11 model. Um, none of these models however, deals with geological uncertainty, the typical uncertainties that we encounter if we try to model real subsurface reservoir speed in a clustic environment or carbonate environment. There's the Bruch field model, which has a number of geostatistical equiprobable realizations that's used for history matching and ensemble type modeling. And about eight years ago, seven years ago, Dan Arnold led the design of what is called the Watt field model, which is Plastic reservoirs based on real subsurface data. And that's an ensemble of reservoir model that encapsulates all the typical uncertainties that we encounter when you characterize a reservoir, when you model a reservoir. And it's a very nice um, tool to play around with if you want to history match, if you want to test a new algorithm, for example, for history matching, uncertainty quantification, testing new WAG modeling schemes, etc. However, none of these models, none of, with the exception of the Unison model, there's no single model that exists for carbonate reservoirs. And considering that carbonate reservoirs contain over 60% of the world's remaining conventional hydrocarbon um, reserves, oil and gas, they're very important also for geothermal energy application, not necessarily for perhaps for electricity generation, but for district heating, or um, equally important for carbon capture and storage um, modeling. We set out, Georges set out to build an ensemble of realistic carbon reservoir models that have a hierarchy of uncertainties that we can deliver an open source format for the community to test their benchmarking um, algorithms, their upscaling algorithms, history matching, optimization, develop new methods, develop, um, if you do develop new numerical methods, the idea is you can use a realistic carbon reservoir that looks like a real reservoir, that behaves like a real reservoir, but it's not, because it's open access, it's not, a real, it's not a real reservoir and can be shared with the wider community. Also for potential tutorials, design projects for MSc PhD programs, or even for friends at computer modeling group, if they want to develop new software tutorials for some of their um, excellent um, simulation tools, we'd be very happy to share it. And indeed, you simply can download it in the very near future for such to develop such exercises. So the key uncertainties that we deal with in carbon reservoirs are very different from clustic reservoirs. And the top four ones here, there tend to be interlinked. So it's a stacking patterns. If you have prograding, retrograding carbonates, if you have an aggregating carbonate ramp, etc. Geometries of these reservoir um, geom um, the reservoir architecture, if you clinoforms, the prograding, 
retrograding, if you more, have more layer cape type setting, on laps, off laps, if you have casts, fractures, permeability, porosity trends, costing upwards, finding upwards, if you have some more vertical stacking, high perm streaks, irregular intervals, and then the geologic environment where these carbonates have formed. Top of this, the uncertainties involve the continuity of the facies, how laterally extensive your facies are, they're more discontinuous, if you have casts, um, if you have fractures and so forth, and the pore system and may have experienced some dolomitization, other day genetic buildup, rudists buildups and so forth. Wettability, another key uncertainty in carbonate reservoirs, um, tends to change with the height above the free water level. Um, so there tends to be a correlation to the irreducible water saturation. And again, the presence of fractures and faults, the extents of fracturing and faults in carbonates are all uncertainty. So our aim was, George's aim was for the PhD thesis to capture, to build a model that captures most of these uncertainties. So we do developed a number of model scenarios on the left hand side, on the y axis, you see the uncertainties in the carbonate reservoir and you have the model scenarios. So things we looked at were the stratigraphic framework, so how carbonates were deposited, deposited, the reservoir rock typing, so how we assigned permeability process distributions to the different facies, how the um, original facies were then digenetically overprinted and altered, and the impact of the formation's wettability on production. In these models, that George has built. We have one truth case that's not revealed to the public. So this is the truth case, which provides us that we treat as the real reservoir. So it has stoip, it has some rates, oil rates, water rates, gas rates from production, and some pressure that we can then use later on for history matching other models against. These other models, they come from ensemble that capture these uncertainties in terms of stratigraphy, rock typing, diagenesis, and wettability and certainty we encounter in model characterized reservoirs that we need to reduce during a history matching um, process. The geology that we're looking at is inspired by the Middle East geology. More um, specifically, we're looking at the Bab Basin here in the UAE. We're essentially looking at the north, roughly north-south trending cross-section. If you take such a cross-section um, to the Bab Basin, then there's quite a difference in um, heights. So we have a series of anticlines from the south to the north, and as we're going northwards, they become deeper and deeper. So there's a roughly 3,000 3, feet um, difference in topology in these anticlines. So the first thing that we wanted to do, or that George did, is that he reconstructed these anticlines because it is it is entire an entirely synthetic data set inspired by real reservoir data so reconstructed that entire um, anticline structure normalized everything so it has a unique um, and uniform oil water contact um, and that um, removed the entire structural difference that we have in the field so that we have a unique um, tectonic setting or unique um, depth regime and our unique coordinate system for that reservoir model. The, the, thought, um, the, the um, units, the formations that we're looking at in the Arabian plates, we um, have been looking at two different units, the Schreiber formation and the upper Karaib formation. Note that they have different names. And these are laterally really extensive formations that go in the yellow from the platform all the way in green to the basin. So from Qatar over here to um, Man to the basin. Um, the upper Karaib formation, that um, is the layer cake aggradational sequence and the Schweiber is a progradational sequence that has these big um, clinoforms in there. And the model that we have built is here for the Karaib formation. This is just sort of to exemplify how we, or how Josh has approached that problem. So for the Schweiber formation, that's a north-south cross-section. So we do have, um, we have some wells here and we try, essentially we need to interpolate the geological, um, um, the geological features, the, uh, um, the stratigraphy in between those wells. So we have the well data to anchor um, 
as anchors and we're interpreting, interpolating in between the data in between those wells. So we would have here our model interpolation that is a much coarser model than the actual truth in inverted commerce, the actual detailed high resolution model that um, we are building in, uh, that, that we have built. So we have that truth model that has a lot of geological data, a lot of geological um, detail encapsulated. But then we, George, has forgotten in inverted commas about that geological data. And we retake, we take the well data and we essentially rebuild that model at a coarser scale with less geological information as it would happen in reality if this would be a real reservoir that we're characterizing, modeling, and eventually simulating. Now, to interpolate data between wells we, in, in a sequence stratigraphy framework, um, we would normally have some seismic data. We didn't have seismic data. So um, we went back actually to the drawing board and fo um, followed the old saying, if you can't draw it, don't model it. So Georges started out by sketching and developing and modeling his geological concepts on a piece of paper. So you have these two anticlines here for which he created synthetic um, contour maps looked at these anticline structures because that allows us to play around with spill points if we move free water levels up and down look at um, how the platform and as we go to the basin how we have a transition zone there so we built our own conceptual model that is inspired by the real data and against um, um, from which we then design the um, the the actual model in Petrel later on so here is the model that we have built um, for the upper Karite member. In terms of data, George spent a lot of time trawling the literature, the peer reviewed literature, the conference papers, the gray literature to source data from a number of anonymized wells from multiple fields in UAE, UAE that um, give us information about the depositional positions, the height above free water level. All these well names um, are completely anonymous and they have their, we put them into their own unique coordinate system. So they look like real data. The, the reservoir is behaving like a real reservoir, but it's a very different scale, a different coordinate system. It has nothing to do in terms of stoip um, and recovery factors of any of the real reservoirs that you would find in the Middle East. Um, for these wells, George, where they created synthetic open hole locks um, in terms of gamma, gamma ray, um, um, Newton um, porosities, um, poroperm data, such that when we provide to the community the raw data, they have data to play with to recreate the models, rebuild the models with perhaps better reservoir rock typing or different re reservoir rock typing methods, make different modeling decisions and design their own reservoir models along the well. However, they also get in the package that we're releasing, we also have some pre-built models to play around with. And then facies, diagenetic overprints that were sourced from the relevant literature. So here you see our model from um, the Upper Karaib, which is inspired by the Upper Karaib formation. This is a top view here with a series of anticlines. The dimensions north-south that we have, um, they go, they are about one third, Third, 160 kilometers in length is roughly one third of the total um, um, of, the, of the total length of the real basin, and we go here from the shelf to the platform to the we have the transition of the basin. And that's sort of what we're capturing in that model that we've built. So here you have the platform. Um, we're looking at the density log here, and um, on the right hand side we're going to the basin, the porosity and the permeability distributions, and generally with a porosity and the permeability being much better in the basin and uh, sorry, in the platform here and over here better higher quality in the basin and lower quality in that transition zone. So one of the ideas as we're going to so stepping through that big carbonate ramp from platform to basin, we see the um, variation in flow architecture and reservoir behaviors that we also see in the real fields in the Middle East. Um, George then went ahead and modeled um, pore size distributions to, um, in, in terms of Windland 35 to um, anchor his reservoir rock typing approach. So you see the pore size distribution, again, better um, reservoir quality, generally speaking, in the platform of the basin, lower reservoir quality in the transition zone, 
and um, we have um, mudstone um, supported fascias at the base and um, better quality fascias at the top of um, of the of the formation. Then use the Winland 35 as a re to guide the reservoir rock typing scheme with a large number um, of reservoir rock types in a truth case model. Probably more reservoir rock types that you than you would put into a real carbonate reservoir model and um, that you build that you design for any practical purposes. The truth model you want to have it as much detail as possible so it behaves as closely as possible to real reservoir. Um, we then created some synthetic scale data, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, that allowed us to model saturation distributions as a function of the height above the free water level and deal with one of the key uncertainties that we normally encounter in real carbonate reservoirs. We assume we have an undersaturated reservoir, um, we used some PVT data from that's publicly available from Middle Eastern Reservoir in terms of bubble point pressures, um, from, um, formation volume factors, and so forth. And we have multiple um, production development scenarios, and we talk about this a little bit later on. Here's a, one of the uncertainties that um, is inherent now to the reservoir, which is where we actually place, based on the data that we've created, the synthetic data but that's inspired by real data, where we place the oil water contact. So you see contour maps here, depending where we place in this oil water contact, we have different closures between the um, um, we, we, reach different closures between the um, between the anticlines. So that changes its dramatic impact on stoip estimates. And also if you say, if you're interested say in carbon capture and storage, how you would design a carbon capture and storage scheme using reservoir, using um, uncertainty in the reservoir that, that you see here will change the design and the amount of CO2 that you're estimating um, that that you think you can inject, that you estimate can be injected into that particular reservoir here, depending on where the height of a free water level or where your um, um, actually is. As I said, um, we created our own scale data. So again, George did a fantastic job sourcing data, looking at data and created his own in-house data set from um, all sorts of data from the that published data, um, conference papers, period papers, the gray literature created this huge data set of semi-synthetic scale data. So we had MICP data, pore size distributions, um, pore perm relationships. And we started grouping this huge data set using Winland 35 and approach we binned um, the we created pore, um, bins of 0.2 micron for pore size distributions and by doing this, he ended up with 27 different rock types here to characterize this huge data set of input um, of, of input scale data. Each of, after he spinned um, the, the input data and created these 27 different rock types, each of these rock types has at least three different capillary pressure curves. So there's an inherent uncertainty which of these curves we should take to initialize our reservoir model later on. Um, there's in the data, there's about 40 PSI different, which corresponds difference in capillary pressure. Um, so that corresponds to roughly 300 feet uncertainty in height above free water level. So when we then initialize the reservoir model, we need to make a choice which of these curves we're going to take for a given rock type. And if you do all possible combinations, we have 53 trillion possible combinations of initializing our reservoir model. So as in nature, so we're facing the same. Um, trying to reproduce the challenges um, that we face in nature in the real world when we're trying to model a reservoir where the way we initialize the initial saturation distribution is going to be different um, from what is actually present in the reservoir. Huge uncertainty in terms of stoip, but also uncertainty in terms of reservoir behavior. Arne talked about hysteresis, so what is what um, your um, reduced water saturation is in your model in a given grid block that is going to impact the effect of your hysteresis behavior later on if you think about um, water and gas injection schemes, for example. So from the data that Josh sourced, we had um, poroperm data. And this is, um, again, from the literature, it's real reservoir data that, that um, Josh has compiled. So it gives us the same type of 
variation in reservoir quality that you would have in that you would find in real carbonate reservoir. We use the poroperm data set along with our um, rock typing based in wind land 35 to have 27, uh, yeah, 27 pore perm distributions, which you then can use to populate the reservoir model with porosities and permeabilities. And for saturation height modeling, used um, skeleton, Har skeleton Harrison, the skeleton Harrison function with this about 10 meters, 30 feet uncertainty in the free water level. Other uncertainties in the dynamic data, um, where how you um, assign wettability and um, relative permeability curves. So again, looking through the literature and um, using Boop's Cori model, we generated a set of um, relative permeability curves, relative permeability curves for drainage and inhibition for each individual rock type, um, going from strongly water wet to um, strongly oil wet rock types, um, and we cor correlated the residual oil saturation and the irreducible water saturation as a function of height about the free water level. So we have a distribution of wettability in the reservoir that is very similar to what you would find in a real Middle Eastern carbonate reservoir. Again, here you have the big platform to basin model, and now we have these different anticlines from which you can cut out reservoirs you can play around with. And each of these different anticline structures has very different flow behaviors. So what you see here are um, the flow unit architectures in terms of the um, cumulative flow and storage capacity. Blue is the um, storage capacity, red is the flow capacity. So we see, for example, that in the platform region that roughly 80% um, of the flow are carried in the upper part of the reservoir and then 20% um, of the flow are carried by the lower part of the reservoir. In the transition zone, that is of lower reservoir quality, it's a much more gradual approach. And again, a much of flow heterogeneity here towards um, basin water. And we have our static model. We've our built our truth model. We have um, the ability to build additional models play around with the data that simplify the data that cause the model and so forth. But we also need to create some synthetic production data for that truth model if someone wants to do history matching later on. So for, sorry for jumping back here, for that um, platform model, we have developed then our field and we created our own field development plan, looking at sort of typical field development plans in the Middle East, the drilling rates, the number of wells that are drilled um, per rigs, how many rigs are operating. I should point out this is, um, we assume this is an onshore reservoir. So the simulation model is 60, roughly 60 kilometers long, 26 kilometers wide. Um, it's gently dipping flanks. Um, we have 50 geological zones, 62 layers. Um, the layering is between 0.6 feet and 8 feet in thickness. Grid cells are 250 by 250 meters long. We have done some grid resolution studies to understand how grid refinement impacts um, um, the, the simulation results. The model here is 1.7 million active grid blocks, so it's not an easy model to simulate. We want to go out and really challenge um, the latest simulation technology. But as we're going to these big Middle Eastern reservoirs, these big carbonate reservoirs, they become more, um, they are big, model, big reservoir models that are difficult to simulate and we make implicit um, decision about grid refinement, upscaling and so forth, that we wanted, um, that we wanted to present the same challenges to the end users later on. We have an active um, aquifer where we use the character and Tracy model we originally have 17 appraisal wells and um, we convert these 17 appraisal wells into production wells and we simply let them flow for the first five years. And then we start um, drilling sequentially production wells and um, infill water injection, peripheral water injections during a drilling campaign that lasts from 2020 to 2038 using sort of typical um, drilling approaches that you find across the Middle East in these big onshore reservoirs. So this is the location of um, what you see is the oil potential, top layer, the bottom layer, and the location of the um, um, appraisal wells. So remember, these are um, wells, completely anonymized wells, easy, um, at a different datum, different um, um, positions in compared to real life. Um, they have their own synthetic locks, so 
this is why we can share it um, as, as an open access data set. What you see here is now the production curve, the initial five years, and then we ramp up production as we bring in more, as we drill in more and more wells. You see the cumulative production below, and we played around a little bit um, with different production rates to find sort of a good target plateau rate that maximizes plateau for, um, for a long period. So what you see is now after 2025, we start bringing the virtual drill rigs on board, and we start drilling the first production um, wells and infill injectors. We sort of do this by trying to find you know, what, what you do in the real world and saying, based on our reservoir, where's the best um, um, reservoir qualities? That's what we target um, for the initial drilling campaigns. So we move the well, the rigs around, we drill more and more and more, more and more wells until we have really highly drilled um, um, reservoir that is producing at um, typical rates for the cumulative rates for the Middle East based on which um, overall production rate we assume for the wells, uh, sorry, which overall which individual um, production rates we assume for the wells, we get um, different water cuts for the fields. Now, this is for the highest rate, which we actually went to uh, lower, lower well rates. Um, initially, we get a bit of a higher water cut because some of the appraisal wells, they are um, close to the free water levels, we're getting water coning um, as we drill additional infill producers and injectors. Um, the water cut then decreases and only later on when we get them start to see water breakthrough, it increases again. And of these wells, this is just four examples of the many wells that um, are placed into the reservoir, we get to the typical heterogeneity in terms of well rates, bottom hole pressures, the oil rates are in, in green, the bottom hole pressures in blue, depending where the wells are in terms of the reservoir quality. So um, but ten, um, normally better quality in the crest of the reservoir, um, in the flanks, mid flank, down flank, um, we're getting um, um, we have more problems because of, to maintain um, high well rates because we're getting earlier water breakthrough or the reservoir quality is poorer and the bottom hole pressure at the wells drops too quickly. So what will be released? Um, we will be releasing these multiple geological scenarios for the same reservoir data. So we have pre-built, we and I always should point out this is George's excellent work here. George has pre-built reservoir models that have all 27 reservoir types, but also down to um, five and three rock types. As a result, we have different poroperm groupings, and there's uncertainty in the free water level, and we have two different um, stratigraphic frameworks. So this is released as the base package, along with the synthetic production data with, that someone can use for history matching later on. The original data set is also being released. So for example, the synthetic locks, so you can rebuild your own model. If you think there's a better, more attractive reservoir rock typing approach, or um, you would um, interpret some of the data differently, you can rebuild your model and see how it behaves in front of HISTI matching. Talked about the synthetic production data for HISTI matching for um, forecasting. Again, it's an entirely synthetic data set. It's inspired by real reservoir data, and we think it behaves like or akin to a real reservoir um, in the Middle East. And the aim for the release is quarter four 2020. So um, if you're interested in using this, and follow, look at our Twitter feed, look at the social media, or contact Josh and myself um, about if you um, to, to get notified when that model is being released and where you can download it from. It's going to be quite a substantial data set. And we're working with our IT team at the moment to find the appropriate storage solution. Interested in much more details. Um, here's some of the papers that George has published, and um, he also keeps people, the academic community, up to date through his ResearchGate profile um, about the progress on that um, RESO model. With that, I'm very happy to take any questions that we may have. Sorry, so I, I have to unmute myself. So anyway, they, I am combining the questions so that we can um, uh, finish that uh, before the break. The question is, um, rock wettability can be changing during fluid injection continuously. So is it possible to incorporate it into the model? 
And a related question would be, um, uh, are the wettability criteria based on actual measurements or just assumptions? And if based on measurements, how did you take uh, samples? So we, so to answer the first question, um, we're not changing the wettability dynamically in, in our simulation. It's a good comment. We haven't looked at this yet. Um, um, we simply haven't thought about this. So at the moment, we just simply assume that during the water injection, wettability remains constant. Um, the, the actual wettability distribution, so the data set, this, the, this data set that um, Georges has compiled, um, from, from the literature, there are some, some real measurements in there, but because the data comes from, from a variety of different sources that have, from, from rocks that have the same geological setting, the same age, um, we, had, we had to make our decision of how we then distribute the, the wettability throughout the reservoir. Oh, sorry, our decision, uh, how we distribute the wettability throughout the reservoir. Okay, um, so thank you very much. Uh